So tonight, uh, as in other nights, we're going to take up two different words, two words that will um, undoubtedly reflect on the gospel message. We're going to read a couple of verses together. And our words tonight are the words separate or separated and reconciled. Separated and reconciled. If, you, if you've had any experience, those words are very common to everyday vernacular. To be separated from something or to separate things is, is a constant need in life um, that we do and that we take part in. I can think often uh, my eighth grade final in English class, on the first day of class, my teacher said, the first question on the final exam is going to be how to spell the word separate. And as I was preparing the message, I still found myself misspelling the word, even though it was a final exam question, S-E-P-A-R-A-T-E. I thought, how many of us spell the word wrong? But what you shouldn't get wrong tonight is what we're going to speak on and what this word has to do with the gospel, what has separated us from God and how we can be reconciled. You may get the spelling of this word wrong, but do not get what the Bible says about it wrong. So we're going to read a couple of verses together. One is found in Isaiah 59, Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. The verse says this, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. We'll read that first part one more time. But your sins or but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And one other verse, it's found in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7. Just one other verse for connection here. Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to read verse 26. There's a, a term in here that is thrilling to hear. And then I'm going to speak on tonight. Hebrews 7 and 26. This verse is speaking about the Lord Jesus. And this is what it says. For such a high priest became us. Who is? Now this is describing the Lord Jesus. Who is holy, harmless, undefiled separate from sinners, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Those are my two verses tonight. You can look them up later and go through them. And the things that I want to speak about, considering this word separate, is how sins have separated us from God. Sins that separate. And then I want to speak about a man, the God of heaven who became a man. And it says about him, he was separate from sinners. You think, oh, it just all means the same thing. But it means exactly the opposite. We've been talking about opposites that come together. Well, here's another one. That we have been separated from God because of our sins. But tonight we declare a man who was separate from sinners. You say, is that good news? Well, by the end of this message, hopefully you will agree with me. That is the best of news. That he was separate from sinners. When we think of separation or gaps. I think of gaps or huge chasms, things that have been bridged in life. And, and that is the great task of humanity, is to take things that are divided, that are separated, and bridge them. I think of my favorite story, my favorite bridge story, and anybody who knows me would know this. My favorite bridge story has to do with two of the largest cities in America in 1860. And they were two of the largest cities and yet they were they were separated. And here was a man. His name was William Roebling, Washington Roebling, actually John Roebling and Washington Roebling. This man, John Roebling, and he had a son, Washington Roebling. And together, together, this father and son were able to bring together the two largest cities in the United States in 1883. And those cities were Manhattan and Brooklyn. When they built the Brooklyn Bridge, it spanned over a mile. This huge chasm, a mile long, this bridge, well over 5,400 feet. And these father and son, they did it together. They bridged this chasm. Another great chasm, maybe for people who are more, not, not, not that old, don't remember those days. Um, I used to follow when I was younger. Every time I would ride my bike over a ramp, I thought of Evel Knievel. And I thought of him, and he always wanted to jump the Grand Canyon. And we kind of laughed, because I had been to the Grand Canyon. I thought, it's not possible. It's not possible to jump it. And he always wanted to do it his whole life. In his life, he must have jumped 75 of these 
huge chasms. But it was his son, Robbie Knievel, in 1999. He, he took his motorcycle and he spanned this 230-foot chasm of the great Grand Canyon there, a certain section of it. And everything that his father wanted to do, he got to see his son do when they when they went over that chasm. So it's it's unique. And history has showed us fathers and sons who have come together in order to bridge great separations, whether it was rivers or whether it was canyons. But nothing, nothing compares to the chasm or the separation that was accomplished when God sent his son into the world in order to bring us back to the Father. When God sent his son, Jesus Christ, when the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, to bring us back to God. Reconciliation, we're going to hear about that in the second part of this meeting. A tremendous truth, unparalleled. It's the greatest gap known to man, the greatest separation that we've ever had. And it was bridged by the mediator, because there is one God and one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus, who brought us back to the Father. As we look at these verses that we've read tonight, we've read about sin that separates us. We have been separated from God because of our iniquities, because of our sins. Why has that happened? Since the third page in our Bible, we could attest to this, that there's been a division. There's been a division because God did not leave. Man left. God did not turn his back on us. Man turned his back on God and chose his own will. And we've been doing the same thing ever since, to choose our own way. And since the third page of the Bible, all the way up until today, no page has ever been turned in history without men turning their back on God. And so significant that every time we choose our own way instead of God's, every time that we choose to do something against what he has asked us, we sin. It's, it's part of our makeup. We are born in sin. We are shaped by it. It's in us. There is not a single human being who's ever lived who has not had sin within his heart. And it has separated us from God. Sometimes we just think our wrongs are against our neighbor. Or we think back uh, in the past years and we think, well, I have a couple people that I'm separate from. I don't get along well with my brother anymore. Or, or that coworker, we just don't talk anymore. And you, you think of the separation, you think of what caused it, the evil or the sin within us. But you know, the sins that we've committed, it was, it was the great King David in Psalm 51. He said this about a sin that he had committed against another. He said, my sin is against God and God only. My sin is against God and God only. If you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal son has this huge separation. He divides himself from his father. He goes as far away as possible. And when he realizes the sin that has driven him and his father away, you know what he says? He says, I have sinned against heaven. You see, the first thing you'll have to understand tonight, if you ever expect to be reconciled, is that the separation that you have, that has been caused by your sin, sometimes we look at all the people that we've offended. Our sins are against God, against God and God only. What we have done have been against him. The Bible tells us that over and over again. We think that we can just ask forgiveness from our fellow men, from our family members, from those around us. And sometimes we just absolutely forget that we ever have to ask forgiveness for the one in whom we have wronged. Separated from God because of our sins. Separated. You think, oh, is he around anymore? You know, the Apostle Paul, he talked about a God who is unknown because of sin. You can read about it in Acts chapter 17, unknown, because we didn't even acknowledge him. We forgot all about him in our sin. But you know what he says? He says he's not far from any one of us. He's not far. He's not distant. We think because of sin that we must have to do great things, build higher steeples, pay more money, make more pilgrimages, get on our knees more often in prayer. We must do something to get him to come close. But no. Paul says he's not far from every one of us. In fact, Christ couldn't have come any closer than when he came to Calvary. The one who came to Calvary came as close as he could, and he came as close to the problem as possible. And salvation tonight, it's not because God is distant. It's because we are distant. 
He has not moved. Christ has not gone any distance from Calvary. You say he's in heaven tonight. And yet Calvary, where he died, is as fresh as ever. It's as though it happened today in God's eyes, that it is not separated by time. And eternity will still declare it as the only way in which you can get back to God, separate from God because of our sins. But thank God for a man, Jesus Christ. And it says this about him. He was separate from sinners. You say, Dave, that's terrible. Terrible news that he's separate from sinners. He's our only hope. No, what makes him our only hope is just this. He wasn't a sinner. He didn't have our problem. You ever drowned in a pool or in the ocean? You're not looking for people who can't swim. When you go under the, 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 the operating room, when you go under the knife in the operating room, you're looking for the man who has been tested, who knows what he's doing. You see, when you're looking to get problems solved, sometimes we just, we say, I need someone who doesn't have my problem. The blind can't lead the blind. You know, the person in the wheelchair can't push another person in a wheelchair. I've experienced that lately. You say, you need someone without your problem to take care of your problem. And the Bible says, here is a man who is separate from sinners. He, he had no, he was holy, harmless, undefiled, the verse says separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Why? So that he could take on him our problem and die for it. The Bible tells me, here is a man who didn't have the problem I had, and I would have expected him to separate himself from me as far as I can, but instead he came right to where I was, and he died for sins. And when he died from sins, you may read a lot about Calvary. In fact, those six hours at Calvary, there's there's a lot in our Bible that is written about them. It talks about the place and what the shape of it was. It talks about the way that the sun was that day. It talks about the individuals who were there. It talks about writings that were on the cross. It talks about individuals who were nailed next to him. It, it talks about pains at the cross and, and spears at the cross and thirst at the cross and words at the cross. But one of the greatest statements that you can read of that is so past understanding to the human mind is just this. At that cross, Christ was separated from God for the first time and for the only time. And Christ crawled out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here was a man who was God forsaken. We talk about God forsaken places or God forsaken people. Never say that again, because it was true of no one except for one man, Jesus Christ forsaken, separated from God. Why? So that you could be reconciled. Here was a man, separate from sinners, didn't have a sin in him, never thought a sin, never did a sin. And yet here he was at Calvary, being separated from his father in order to die for those of us that were separate from God because of our sins. He was dying because of the problem that separated us. How tremendous that the father and the son that they went to Calvary, and there the father gave his son, and the distance that it was experienced there, in order for this great gap, this great separated separation to be made nothing, for us to be reconciled to God. The Bible says it so succinctly in the words of Peter. It was the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. You could know this truth tonight. You could be saved. You could be reconciled. If only you would recognize my sins have separated me from God because they're against him. But my hope is found in one man, Jesus Christ, who was separate from sinners. And at Calvary was separated from his God in order that he might save my soul. It's an amazing truth. It's a truth that is as good as today as it was a thousand years ago. And it's a truth that will be just as tremendous a million years from now. Nothing will ever parallel it. Nothing will ever be greater than the news that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Separation may be a negative term, but the fact that you could be reconciled to God tonight, if only you would realize I'm the one who separated myself, I'm the sinner, Christ is the Savior. He's the one who was separate from sinners. And thank God he did that in order to bring me back into a relationship 
with the Father. We pray that tonight, as you continue to listen to Matt, you might recognize the tremendous, tremendous blessing that there is in being reconciled to God. All right, we're going to read uh, just a couple of verses here. And uh, thanks for being with us this evening again. I want to speak about the word reconciled or reconciliation. And I'm going to read verses that might sound uh, confusing at first, but I just trust with God's help we can break them down. So the first one is in the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. And it says these words in, in our Bibles, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile, there's that word again, all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And the other reading is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and there's just a verse here that we'll read together. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. It doesn't say he reconciles us as human beings to himself by a church or by good works or by anything. It says by Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses against them or convicting them of their trespasses and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so that's what we're going to speak about tonight. It's very interesting if you, uh, I'm just a numbers guy, just, just I find it fascinating to look at how many times a word is used in scripture. But uh, if you were to look at the word reconciled and the word reconciliation, you'd see reconciled is in the Bible six times. And reconciliation is in the Bible eight times. And what I thought when I read that just earlier uh, this week as I was sort of just preparing for this message was uh, in the middle of the number six and the number eight is the number seven in which you would see perfection aligned with in scripture as the number seven. And I would say this, that when someone is reconciled and comes into the goodness of reconciliation, they experience the perfection of God's salvation provided through Christ. So when a sinner is reconciled, when a sinner, a sinner sees the gap that is between God and man, and they understand that Christ, the mediator, came to bridge the gap, and they come into that goodness of being reconciled unto God, understanding the just one died for them, the unjust, and paid for their sins on a cross. They experience that perfection of God's salvation provided through the person of Christ. It takes two to reconcile. Just like it takes two to quarrel, it takes two to reconcile. The challenge I have as I was studying just this particular word was uh, God's arms have always been wide open. He has always been accepting of sinners. He says, come to me and I will never cast you out. So why is it that the one side, the, as if all of heaven or the Godhead wants to reconcile and man doesn't want to? That's a searching question. Perhaps you can just ask yourself as you search your own heart and just be reflective and transparent and vulnerable with God. Just answer that question. Why is it that God wants reconciliation? And if you're not saved today, that's because you don't want reconciliation and perhaps haven't understood what reconciliation really is. So reconciliation is available because a sinner is unwilling uh, and there's really no reconciliation. Dave spoke of those that truth that sins have separated you and your God and that shows us the need for this reconciliation. Reconciliation is bringing God and man together. It's not on man's part. It's on God's part. And it touches really grace that we've been learning about really the last uh, couple of weeks together. God giving us things that we don't deserve. We have never merited. The Greek roots of uh, this word reconciliation, or it's called alasso. It means to change or exchange. It involves a change in the relationship between God and man. It also involves a change in the relationship when we look at believers, as Paul is writing, to man and man, it involves a breakdown in a relationship. If you look at scripture, you would see the breakdown in God's relationship with man when man sinned in the garden. So when you see a breakdown in a relationship, uh, now there has been a change from a state of enmity when we think of reconciliation, a state of enmity and fragmentation to one of harmony and fellowship. What was once broken is now repaired. And that word is reconciliation. That's why in the book of Romans chapter five, Paul is saying, as he's speaking 
that before reconciliation, we were powerless. You see that in verses 6 through 11. We were ungodly. Sinners are powerless. Sinners are ungodly. Sinners are exactly what they are called. They're sinners. We sin. We are born in sin, in sin and shaped in iniquity. Our hearts desperately wicked. Paul says we are enemies of the cross. We are under God's wrath. And that's why he says because of an, a change or reconciliation, an unbeliever can become a new believer. A sinner can become saved. And on their way to heaven, they become new creatures. And he writes that in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. The old being born in sin, the new being born from above has come. And that person is completely changed. There was a pastor who met with two brothers over a long-standing feud and he met with them just to reconcile and have their differences and shake it out and sort of just, just be friends again. And when they were about to leave, these two brothers, he told them, well, why don't you make a wish? Christmas is coming up and you're going to spend the next, uh, you know, probably a few hours with family during Christmas time. And um, maybe you just make a wish for each other. And the first brother turned to his other brother, uh, the one that he had a feud with at first, the one that the pastor thought had, they had reconciled, they had brought things together. He turned to his brother and he said, I wish you what you wish me. And the second brother threw up his hands and he said, see, pastor, he's, he's starting up all over again. You know what the problem is? They met. They weren't, they weren't vulnerable with each other. They met with hidden motives. This is not re reconciliation. They both had it on their hearts to do each other wrong. When we speak about reconciliation with man and God, God has his arms willing and able to take any sinner that comes unto him. And he provided a solution. He provided salvation through the person of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was sinless died for those who are sinful. He died as the substitute for man. He paid for sin once and forever. And God wants to reconcile through the person of Christ. He wants to bring us together. You understand? We've had it in our hearts not to go to God, to do our own thing. The Bible says we, have, we are like sheep in Isaiah 53, sheep that have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, but he's constantly seeking. He's constantly trying to save. He's constantly seeking those that are lost, and he wants to reconcile. Just keep in mind this. If you've strayed from God and, and you don't want God in your life, the Bible teaches this, a solemn truth here. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends there are are the ways of death. There's many times we need to reconcile even with relationships. If you're married on the call, uh, you, you would know the times that you have to just get together and push everything to the side and say, okay, listen, I'm sorry. Let's make things right. It's for the benefit of the relationship. You do everything in your power to bridge the thing that's broken and bring it back together. You reconcile. We do this with friendships. Pastors do it with churches. Churches do it with pastors when there's an offense being driven. A boss does it with his employee and vice versa. Our children need to reconcile. We need to make relationships right. What was once broken needs to be repaired. Think about this. When we sinned against God, we broke a relationship with God and God needed to do something to repair that relationship. And he provided his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Relationship has to do with a man's broken state, our fall of sin, and God seeking to reconcile them back to himself. The need of sin's curse to be identified. Have you ever understood that we've sinned? Have you ever understood that there's a day that sinners, if they don't come to trust Christ, will have to pay for their sins? And the Savior of sinners can be glorified in your life even today. Reconciliation has to do with the relationships between God and mankind. When we look at scripture, we look at the gospel. If you have a problem, even as a believer, just as a side note, uh, the Bible would teach through reconciliation that we need to bring those problems together and fix that problem and build the relationship. But God calls the world to himself. Let's focus on the gospel in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 18. That word reconciliation takes place through a cross death. It is foreign to what man would have ever thought. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, a favorite verse of mine personally, says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. So Christ came, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. And God reconciles the world to himself. He reconciles the sinner to himself through the death of his son. That's why Romans 5 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Once someone comes to trust Christ, they are no longer enemies. When someone comes to trust Christ, they are no, no longer considered ungodly and condemned. When someone comes to trust Christ, they're no longer considered sinners under condemnation or powerless. 
Now they have the Holy Spirit. Now God looks down from heaven and sees the work of his son that covers their sins, that removes the penalty, the payment, the burden of their sin as far as the east is from the west. Think of these words as the love of God being poured in their hearts through the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5. Now he says these words. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That is for the believer. It's a total change of the state in your life. Translated out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Once separated by a huge gulf, now brought together through the person of Christ. If you were to look at the story of uh, Adam and Eve uh, in the touch as they touch the forbidden tree by God. Listen to the words that uh, the enemy says to Adam and Eve. Listen to these words. Now the serpent was shrewder. That word means more clever than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, is it really true that God said you must not eat from any tree of the orchard? The woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the tree or the fruit of the trees of the orchard, but concerning the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the orchard, God said, you must not eat from it and you must not touch it or else you will die. And the woman said to the serpent, surely you won't die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That question that the enemy asked the woman that day, is it really true that God had said? The world today has been listening to the same words. Has God really said you can't lie? Yes, God has said that. Has God really said as the enemy questions the sinner, you can't steal or you can't covet or you can't murder or you can't commit adultery or you can't fornicate or you can't say bad things against your neighbor or you can't just love yourself and no one else or you can't be selfish. Did God really say that you can't get to heaven with your works? God said we can't get to heaven with our works. It's solely through the person of Christ and the lies from the enemy. They cursed men then. And they curse them even today. And that's why we're taking up subjects like this. Separation and reconciliation. Once in our sin, one once naked, just like Adam and Eve here, they're embarrassed in their sins. God comes in the cool of the evening. Notice the grace of God. He says, Adam, Adam, where art thou? You know where they are. They're hiding with fig leaves. They have clothed themselves. They're trying to hide from God in their sin. Are you trying to hide from God in your sin? Perhaps covering our sin with good works. Perhaps covering our sin with church membership. Perhaps covering our sin with the costume of tithing or hiding under the sin if you're a younger one on the call. Maybe hiding uh, our sin under the umbrella of our Christian parents. God sees everything. Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23 says, be sure your sin will find you out. And that relationship, as Dave spoke, was broken. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And from the moment that Adam and Eve fell in the garden, there was absolute havoc all throughout the world. Noah's day, Sodom's day, men rejecting God, men living in wickedness. Those relationships needed reconciliation, and that comes solely through the work of Christ. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or not reckoning their trespasses to them. And it has con committed, he says, to us the word of reconciliation. Now that's to the believer. It is Christ through the cross who has made reconciliation or made what was broken, made right possible. For God made him, listen carefully, to be sin for you and for I. It's also related to justification. Just as if you've never sinned. Le listen to these words in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Now, and much more than because we have now been declared righteous. By his blood, or the thought there in Greek is at the price of his blood, we will be saved through him, through Christ, from God's wrath. Have you ever come into the good of reconciliation? To know peace with God, to know oneness with him, to know hope and the assurance of heaven, to know the friend that never leaves nor forsakes. Just let me take your eyes to the prodigal son. Dave mentioned it, but I just want to touch just for a moment on one thing. He says to the father, give me, let me taste of the world. Give me all my inheritance. And he goes into a far land and he wastes his living. So much so the prodigal son in our, in our New Testament teaches us this, that he's found eating with pigs. He's found deserted by his friends. He's found poor. He's found powerless. He's found in famine. He's found separated by his father. There needs to be reconciliation. Notice the repentance. The Bible teaches, except you repent, you'll perish. And the son repents. He says, I will go to my father. 
and I will tell my father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. But notice as he's going to his father, his father's waiting with arms that are wide open. Friend, listen, you could say, listen, I'm going to go to God. I'm going to tell him that I've sinned. He's waiting. He's been waiting the whole time. He bids you to come. Come unto, him, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let me close with a quick story. There was a young girl down in, a, in Mexico who's at 14 years old. She w- decided to leave home and uh, abandon everything she knew. She was used by the world. She was enticed by beauty and modeling and everything. So her father went out over the next couple of years and he kept putting pictures of her in every hotel and every room and every library and schools and just trying to find her. And on that picture, he wrote, my love, please come home. You're forgiven. One night at 16, two years later from leaving home, this young lady came stumbling out of a dirty hotel room only to see a sign at the bottom of the stairs. And the sign had her little picture of when she was pure. And her father's note said these words, my love, please come home. You're forgiven. She grabbed a piece of paper and she prepared a huge apology speech for her father. And she went home and before she could get home, her father ran in the driveway and he took her and said, and as she began to take out her paper, he said, just stop. You've already been forgiven. Reconciled. The the gap that was between her and her father brought together by the father's love for her. What was broken? was made right. Two parties brought together by the Father's love. You can be brought together by the Father's love. He expressed his love on an old rugged cross. You know what Psalm 32 says for the believer who's come to trust that their sins have been paid for? Blessed is the one. Listen, the joy of one forgiven. Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed is the one whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Blessed or happy. He says, is the man in whose spirit there is no guile. You can experience pureness. You can experience oneness. You can experience the the forgiven uh, work of Christ as he paid for sins. He forgave your sins. He brought reconciliation. God reconciled to man all through the person of Christ. And he did that just for you. Would you come to him today? Just know your sins forgiven. It's not a church membership. It's having a relationship with the God of heaven through Christ. And you can experience what Paul wrote in Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, not by works, by faith in Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ.